Uh, intimate group. Refuges and precepts. Great. Actually, that's not it. I'm missing something. Sorry. And today, um, oh, sorry, no. Oh, it's okay. Uh, Katie, will you put? The, would you pop those in? Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. So today, the theme of the day is is uh, right action. Samakamanta, samakamanta, and uh, the precepts are very much part of that. So. It's, uh, it's always good to be taking them anyway and to be living mm -hmm. by them, but it's particularly relevant to the teaching today. So let's just wait another minute or so. People popping in here. Yeah. All right, so if you can, can you get them up as a screen share? Okay, thank you. Do a, a call and response. So I'll chant three times Namo Tassa, homage to the Buddha. And then uh, you chant three times. And then we'll go through the refuges line by line. I'll chant and then you chant. And if you could please be muted. So you'll be just chanting at home. But... Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Okay. Actually, I would just ask and Noam or Katie if one of you could unmute, then I get to hear you. That would be nice. You can get to hear some. Maybe Katie, would you do it? Bhutang Saranang Gachami. Bhutang Saranang Gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Sankhang saranang gachami. Sankhang saranang gachami. Vityampi putang saranang gachami. Vityampi. Saranang Gachami. Pity Ampi Sankang Saranang Gachami. Atiyampi Bhutang Saranang Gachami. 
Precepts. I'm going to chant the Pali and then you say the English after I've done the Pali. Pali isn't written here, but I just like to say it. Panati Patavera Mani Sika Padang Samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adina dana vera mani sika padang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to retain, to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame sumi chachara vera mani sika padang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musavada vera mani sika padang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. Sura mereya majapamadatana. Vera mani sikha padang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Imani pancha sikha padani silena sukhatin yanti silena poka sampada. Silena nimbuting yantitasma silang visotaye. These are the five precepts. Sila, or ethics, are a support for true happiness. Ethics are a support for true wealth. Ethics are a support for the peacefulness of nibbana, of enlightenment. Therefore, let sila, these ethics, be purified. And uh, then we can chant the Eightfold Path Mantra if you have that available. Good. So I'm going to, ch it's, we're going to chant it nine times. It seems kind of long, but it's good to do because it gets it, we really gets it into the system. And uh, hopefully this will come back to you through the day or through the weeks and remind you, you know, when the mind is wandering off here and there, remind you of the Eightfold Path, which is always here, as Katie noticed earlier. Samadipti Samma Sankapa Samma Vacha Samma Kamanta Samma Hajiwa Samma Vayama Samma Sati Samma Samadhi Samma Dipti Samma Sankapa Samma Vacha Samma Kamanta Samma Hajiwa Samma Vayama Samma Sati Samma Samadhi Samma Dipti Samma Sankapa Samma Vacha Samma Kamanta Samma Hajiwa Samma Vayama Samma Sati Samma Samadhi Samma Dipti Samma Sankapa Samma Vacha Samma Kamanta Samma Hajiwa Samma Vayama 
Samma Sati Samma Samadhi Samma Ditti Samma Sankapa Samma Vacha Samma Kamanta Samma Hajiva Samma Vayama Samma Sati Samma Samadhi Samma Ditti Di Samma Sankapa Samma Vacha Samma Kamanta Samma Hajiva Samma Vayama Samma Sati Samma Samadhi Samma Ditti Samma Sankapa Samma Vacha, Samma Kamanta, Samma Hajiva, Samma Vayama, Samma Sati, Samma Samadhi, Samma Ditti, Samma Sankapa, Samma Vacha, Samma Kamanta, Samma Hajiva, Samma Vayama, Samma Sati, Samma Samadhi, Samma Ditti, Samma Sankapa, Samma Vacha, Samma Kamanta, Samma Hajiva, Samma Vayama, Samma Sati Samma Samadhi. Okay. So. Now I'm, I, I kind of jumped straight in. I don't know if you wanted to uh, say anything. Sorry. <laughs> Um, that's fine. Um, welcome everyone. Welcome I am the Ananda Bodhi and uh, we're always so happy to have you and the sisters here. Um, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective and uh, yeah, we're, we're just thrilled that you're here. I don't have more to say at this time. <laughs> So we're going to have a period of meditation now. And uh, before we start, so find, first of all, find a posture that's supportive, you know, that's comfortable, but uh, not too comfortable. Where there's a, a sense of alertness. I want you to see the Buddha. He's hiding behind me here. Let me just move a little bit. Yeah. That's better. Okay. <clears throat> so you find a, a posture that's comfortable but where you're relaxed but also alert there's energy so the spine is straight as much as possible not in a forced way not in a not in a tight way but just as though imagine as though you were you were, had a thread from the top of your head that in your it's just lifting you up a little bit and then you can feel the support of the ground beneath you the seat beneath you and you can feel that slight lifting upwards not not in a floaty way so you've got the groundedness of your body and then you've got the the crown of the head slightly lifting upwards so that just elongates the spine this allows energy to flow freely during a meditation we all tend to have places where we, we uh, you know, maybe sit in crunched ways or lean one way or so on. And so in the meditation, we're trying to find this posture that's alert and also relaxed, open and grounded.
And just being aware of what you're bringing to this meditation, you know, what, what is the state of the mind? Are you feeling scattered or centered, clear or scrambly? Is the mind preoccupied or is it eager to settle? Or any other state that you might find? Just bringing your attention inward. Being aware of your breath. So you can recognize the supports that you have right now, the practice, body that's healthy enough, a mind that's clear enough. And then that intention, intention to settle, to allow the mind to deepen, perhaps to connect with the natural wisdom that is always present. And being aware of the supports of Sangha, of community, and of the basic requisites, having enough to eat, drink, drink clothing, shelter, roof over the head, having uh, medicine, even if it's not the best, enough. So feeling the supports that are present. And letting that be something that you can rest into. If there's a sense of anxiety or worry about the future, or um, regret over the past that's present to you right now. And just acknowledge that and see if you can take that and put it on a shelf for now. Just be here with this body, in this moment, with this breath. So right now, the right action is to let go of thoughts, let go of concerns. Buddha uses this phrase, letting go of covetousness and grief for the world, the wanting and not wanting that we might have in relation to the world, letting that go for now. Just settling into this moment. Being aware 
being mindful of breathing in and breathing out. For the in-breath, we're taking in this life energy. The in-breath can help brighten our mind and body. Breathing out, we're letting go. Letting it all go.
So looking today into right action. Samma Kamanta. So um, I've spoken before about this word Samma, which is, you know, we translate often as right, right, wrong. And, and it is in some of the suttas. I think Bhikkhu Bodhi uses that term, right, uh, right action and wrong action. And that can be helpful. It can be kind of clear and helpful. It can be unhelpful. It depends. We have different relationships. People have different relationships to words. And uh, so I want to just, uh, before I start into the, just to, just to mention about Samma again, that it's, uh, it has that there are various ways we can translate that. So one way that I like very much is a tune. When you're tuning a tuning up a musical instrument, you know if you if you if you tune it up too tight, then it, it sounds really bad. And if you turn it too loose, then it hardly makes a sound at all flat. But if you have it just tuned just right, then it's beautiful. And uh, another. Expression. I've, another translation I've heard is is to be in harmony, which is sort of related, really, so that your um, your actions are in harmony with the path, or they're, they're in harmony with the path of awakening, attuned to the path of awakening. Um, one translation that's often used is wise, wise action, and uh, I don't like that translation very much because there is a there is a Pali word for wise, which is uh, wisdom, panya, and it often tr uh, points more to the, the 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 truth of the way things are, so the the constant changing nature of things. And so, for me to translate this as wise doesn't quite work. Although it is a wise choice to choose samakamanta. Uh, so I like to think of it as an attunement or as a, a being in harmony with the path. So this is action that is in harmony with the path. And uh, the word kam, samma kamanta. So kamma, kamanta, kamma, uh, the Pali word for karma, which is more commonly used in America. Kamma means action. And uh, th this, this word was used in the, at this time, action. Um, and then the Buddha uh, took that word and made it a little bit, he slightly shifted it to uh, the word karma to action with intention. It's not just what you do, but it's, it's why you do what you do. And uh, very specifically, Samma Kamanta is pointing to those first three precepts that we took at the beginning. So. I undertake the precepts to refrain from taking the life of any living being, intentionally taking the life of any living being, and, and take the precepts to refrain from taking what is not given from stealing, and I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. And that has quite specific um, description in the suttas, which is very androcentric, it's very much around men's relationship to women. I think we can make it a bit more relevant to this time, but it's essentially um, to respect the the relationship that you're in, the boundaries of the relationship you're in, uh, the mutual agreement of your relationship, and to respect the the agreements of the relationships other people are in. So those are the three precepts that that really you know. Uh, Pointed to in relation to right action, summer come on. And you know, the Buddha often in, in the Buddhist teaching is often in this negative. So, you know, you think about right action is, is doing something, you know, action is doing something, putting something out into the world. And then you look at, well, what is that? And it's like to not do this and to not do that. And, and uh, so it's actually interesting that the action is to refrain from doing things which will harm others. Initially, so the the action to refrain from intentionally taking the life of a living being, any living being. This includes spiders and ants and human beings. 
So, uh, so we first of all we have that intention to refrain from taking a life, and you know it might be when when people first start on the path, you know that they they wouldn't that they it's clear you know I wouldn't want to kill another human being, and not for everybody. Some people some people do and have killed other living beings, but um, it's you might think like well yeah of course I'm not going to kill anyone, but you know the spiders in my room of course i'm going to kill those because they're inconvenient and then and then it's like well no it includes the spiders in your room and then they're like oh so then it invites this reflection of, of uh so why would i why would that matter you know i've done that all my life so you might think and and so it, it invites that reflection of i like to live you know i have i have this life I want to take care of it and, and make good use of it as best as I can until it's time for me to die. And uh, and with that spider also has its life and wants to take care of it as long as it can. I have spiders in my room. They like they, they like to kind of crawl in at night. And uh, and it's very clear how you know and every now and again I catch them, put them outside. And, and it's very clear how once I start catching them, word gets around. You know they they like they start getting vigilant because they know that oh she there she is with her feather dust thing now she's going to take us outside and so they 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 definitely are, are responding you know that they they want to stay in that environment they want to stay where they are they don't want to be harmed and they don't want to be uh, taken out of their environment but I do take them out because it's um, but not not to harm them. So it's it's you can really see it. You know they're, they're not it's not they're not just passive. You know they 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 run away. They they start getting vigilant because there's this. Um, I guess it could be perceived to them as a, as a threat on their life that they're being being moved from where they've settled in. So so it's that reflection of well, I like to be. You know, I want to have safety. I want to be protected. I want to have, be able to live my life in a way that's not always in fear. And so, just as I'm, this is that's true for me. It's true for others: human, animal, insect, any living being, want to uh, protect its life. So then we we put ourselves in their shoes, and then it's like, well, of course, why would I want to harm you? What if somebody didn't like, you know, me being here? Somebody doesn't like Buddhist nuns in Placerville. So does that make it okay for them to come and kill us? You know, no, it doesn't. Even those things happen, actually. Well, in this country and other countries, it's not that doesn't make it okay because you don't like something. Some, and it's uh, you know I know what I'm saying is very basic and, and you all know that, but these are this these are the reflections that we need to have in our mind. If I don't want to, somebody to come around and destroy me because they don't like me. I don't want to destroy somebody else, some other being. But I do not. So. Uh, the, the action of refraining from destroying life. And then there's the, the action of refraining from stealing, from taking what's not given. You know, just as I don't want people to come and steal the things that I have, I won't steal the things that other people have. So it's like, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And um, with uh, the sex and misconduct precept that's around, you know, if you're in a relationship, you wouldn't want. Um, you wouldn't want someone else to be um, having sexual relationship with your partner when it's not agreed on. And so likewise, you're not going to do that with somebody else's partner. There's a sense of respect, boundaries. And with all of the precepts, there's, uh, there, are, there are these different layers to them. So first of all, we train ourselves. Well, actually before that, before that, actually, there's the there's the understanding of why we want to do that in the first place. Why do we want to why do we want to live within the precepts in the first place? Why do we want to live in an ethical way? So, for many people, I'm one of them. Um, not everybody starts with having good ethics. So, I didn't have the good fortune to start off with. You know, in an environment that was where where the five precepts were normal, and and there's actually somebody in the community at the moment whose you know, whose family were very much aligned with that, even though they weren't Buddhist, and and it's just very interesting to see how what you know in some ways it's a very simple life when you you know you're raised with a with these kind of really good ethics, and and uh, you don't it doesn't even cross your mind to to 
palm or steel or any of those, any of those eye or anything. And uh, what, a, what a wonderful thing to have that right from the beginning. And then for some of us, it wasn't like that. We had to learn through um, uh, feeling the repercussions of our actions, doing stuff and then, and then recognizing it's really bad inside and that creates a lot of chaos outside. And it's, or even it's just, just not helpful. And it's like lying, you know, you might be able to kind of get away with it and nobody even knows, but it's not helping you. It's not helping ourselves on the path. Uh, that's anyway, that's the fourth precept. So, first of all, there has to be right understanding, samadhi, or attuned understanding. That uh, you know, when we live in a way that's the egocentric, where we do what we want for ourselves, we get what we want for ourselves, and we do whatever we want in order to fit to get what we think will make us happy. That leads to more dukkha, more, more dissatisfaction, more unsatisfactoriness. Uh, if it's a if it's a selfish intention, and when we live in a way that's uh, respectful of others and has a sense of uh, understanding of the interconnection of, of all of us, how we how we affect each other, and when we live in a way that we understand, just as you know, what what affects me also affects others. What to me may well be also as one of those, which is those fundamental things like and uh, you know, when we understand that that's right for you so we we have that right view that supports moving towards living in a wholesome way and uh, and it may be that we you know when we first come across these teachings we, we don't we, we need to do a lot of work, you know, or it might be that we're already you know, quite uh, aligned. So start from where you are and you know where you're starting from. And not judging it, not uh, not getting too lost in regret. It's, it's useful to have a little bit of regret sometimes, you know, it can spur us along. But um, not, to, not to just get lost in there, but to just recognize that like, this is just not, not helpful. It's not helping me, it's not helping anyone. I want to drop that. So that's that's like right understanding, samadhi. And then we need um, right effort, samavayama, to support that. So it's like we know we want to change, and then we've got to put the effort in to start changing the way we live, changing the way we think, the way we um, manifest in the world. And... Uh, and in order to, to do that, we need right mindfulness, samma sati. So if we, you know if we haven't got mindfulness, we might have a good intention, but we it doesn't it just doesn't go anywhere. We get lost in our own old habits. So we need the understanding that we want to you know we want to direct our life in in a, a way that leads to greater freedom, greater peace, greater harmony, or um, in a way that we can give a, a sense of harmlessness, of, of fearlessness, of safety to others, and that we're not living with a lot of regret for things we've done ourselves, we're living our own life. And uh, so we have right understanding and then right effort, where we, you know, we, we put effort into restraining the old habits and into cultivating a new way of being. And uh, right mindfulness, and that's like the implementation. But we, we know what to do, we, we've got the energy to do it, and then we have to see how, how am I doing in the moment? What do I have to let go of? What do I have to restrain? What do I have to develop? That's the right mindfulness. And uh, in the, it's, it's said in the suttas, these three circle around right action, around each of the paths, actually. Those three circle around it and, and mutually support the, the practice of, of um, summer come on to right action. So uh, we have to know why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, we have to have the energy to want to change. And then we have to 
look into the details of how can we do that not just as, a, as an idea on a piece of paper we might that might be useful to start with but actually as a, as a direct experience and so you know then and then we, we we're, as we use those back to the path and we're changing the way we live we're changing the way we bonds to life and what we bring into life what we bring to life i should say what we bring to life um and then you know, each of those presets you know when as we as we develop and cultivate them we can look at them in different ways you can say i i'm one who refrains from taking a life of living being so i'm very happy to be able to say that you know and, and that's like clear I refrain it just like and it's not a pride thing not i'm one you know but it's this is my clear, clear determination i refrain i do not intentionally take the life of living beings and then the next level is i encourage others not to take the life of living beings and then i speak in praise of not taking the life of living beings and it can be I refrain from taking what's given, what's not given. I encourage others to refrain from taking what's not given. I speak in praise of taking what's not given. I refrain from sexual misconduct. I encourage others to refrain from sexual misconduct. I speak in praise of sexual misconduct. So these are the, the sort of layers that the Buddha points out that we can live by. And uh, recently I've had uh, some conversations is the uh, Dharma practitioners of different of times, of different um, places on the path, each of them. Um, one was actually about spiders, and uh, just to, just to, you know, I, I recognized, oh, they hadn't actually, it hadn't actually occurred to them that that mattered. So then it's like, okay, I'm going to encourage this person to refrain from taking the life of other living beings. And then they really understood it, and then they're kind of happy to take it on, which is kind of I'm happy about that. And the other person I was speaking to, it was a little bit of a bigger picture because they, we were speaking about the situation now uh, that's happening in America with uh, the well, all of it, the the, um, the 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 racial protests, the anti-racism protests, and then the the police and um, the federal militarized police uh, responses in particularly in i think portland has been enormous and long and in other parts of the country and so it was it was on this conversation and and um, this person who's a dharma practitioner was was saying was kind of asking the question of you know is it is it okay to kill you know and i was like what you know um, but to me, it's like very clearly, no, it's not. It's an intentional kill. But they were asking this question: Well, what if you know? What if you're, what if, what if you're protecting some children, or what if you're protecting a group of people, and what if there is a situation where actually you know you might need to take the life of another living, living being? And and um, and it was a, a conversation, and it was also not not just about. Not just between the two of us but it was something that was going to go out to a wider wider audience and um and so we had this conversation i, I realized my first response was kind of alarm that that might be presented as, as okay and then um and then reflecting on so okay so we're talking about a group of people who are already being like african-american people who are already being killed for no for no good reason that's already happening since a long time. American people in America get killed for no good reason since a long time now. And um, and that's something that that community has to live with you know, day in and day out. And so then I was reflecting on that, like, okay, so this is a reality that I don't I don't have to live with that. That's not my reality. The white Buddhist nun here at the moment anyway. And and yet it is for, for many, many people. So to just say no, you shouldn't doesn't seem quite. Enough. And then so we were looking at this um, and this this person I was speaking to. They were saying there are bodhisattvas who who kill, you know, from a perspective of 
you know, out of compassion for others, and then I was reflecting on that and and uh, what we what what came to me was this, you know, because I have really a really clear faith in the Buddha's teaching that the Buddha knew what he was talking about, and that he was really clear, and that back in those days there were also crazy things going on in society, and there was the caste system, and all of that was going on, and there were kings who, you know elders of people and all of those crazy things went on then there's just a different flavor of it going on now and uh, and I, I really have faith that the Buddha absolutely knew what he was talking about and he gave these precepts as a guide as a basic framework for, for all of us to live by and when we're when we're still learning we need to have them they're like an outer framework they're like that which stops us from going too far in things. But as we continue the practice and deepen the practice and insight arises, they're no longer outside stopping us from, from, you know, from going too far. They're, they're in us, they're, 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 they're in the heart. That the heart will not go past those, bills. the heart will not take life of another living being intentionally and it will not steal. You know, it's, it's the point where that can't happen, can't do that anymore. That's like a natural evolution on the path. But until then, we have to kind of take care of those precepts. For, you know, and then as they get deeper and deeper in the heart through understanding and insight and letting go, we don't have to protect them so much, but we do then have to you know, encourage others to understand what they're for and why they're there. And uh, so I was reflecting on this um, phenomenon of, of that, that she was speaking about, this person was speaking about, about bodhisattvas taking the life of other living beings. And, kinds of, and uh, I was reflecting in the, in the Zen tradition, there was a time when uh, the, the practice of emptiness became so one-pointed, so it was not taken within the, con the larger context of the Buddhist teaching. The Buddhist definitely teaches about emptiness, it's in the, in the public canon. But uh, it was taken sort of outside of everything else, and uh, and there would be these practices of cutting off the head with the mind of emptiness, which would actually happen in in the streets. You know, that, that um, soldiers who who were practicing Zen would believe that they would take their mind into a state of emptiness, and because their mind was empty and they were it was, it was empty of self, and that, that the person they were about to decapitate his empty self. There was no harm done, and this was a belief that was taken, and and that has happened. And, and I've, I've read accounts of people who experienced, who've, who witnessed that. You know, so it was a very terrible thing, and then really taking the teaching completely out of context. So I was reflecting that that's that's where you you take something and then you take it out of context, and it's too cold. There's no warmth of humanity. There's no sense of sentience. Uh, you know, people just emptiness, you know. And then on the other hand, we've had in in Burma not so long ago the the um, kind of killing in defense in in defense of protecting the Dharma, which of course is a very confused. View. And uh, and that I would say is like too much too much heat, too much passion, attachment. So one was too cold with too little little attachment or not enough, maybe attachment isn't the right word, not enough um, relating to the, the, you know, the sentience, not even just human, but the sentience of this that absolutely did relate to. And the other was too much about like, this is right, I'm right, and it has to be like this, and being an excuse for killing. And so... You know, one's too cold, one's too hot, and there in the middle is the precept of like that place is not one extreme or another, it's just there, right there in the middle. And then, you know, the question still remains, you know, what if, what if some terrible thing happened and, and I had to defend a child or the people? We don't know what we would do. But what we need to do now, while we're not in that situation, is to train our hearts and minds in harmlessness, in, in non-violence, in, uh, in strength also, 
you know, to develop this strength of mind that's that um, is willing to endure. The Buddha talks quite a bit about this actually. Willing to endure criticism, you know, that we're willing to endure criticism and uh, harsh words and uh, even even physical attacks. You know, he goes through a whole list of things like train yourself. And this isn't about being. I'm not. I'm not advocating that we're all supposed to just be like doormats and, and people abuse us. I'm not saying that sort of thing at all. But it's more like um, if we can develop a strength, an inner strength, and an inner, inner resilience, and a and a centeredness that that's centered in the Dhamma, that's centered in um, understanding the true nature of things, understanding that in going, understanding impermanence. Then we can endure difficult stuff without um, having to retaliate. And I think that's very important. It can be centered in the midst of, of challenges. And uh, I, it's, it was interesting for me to have this conversation though, because for me, the, the first precept has always been sort of like obvious, you know, of course, you know, you can do that. And uh, even in my life before now, you know, it's like a, probably the biggest thing that ever died in my hands was it was a tiny little red spider or something like that, a little mite or something that I used to wish them when I was a little girl, not knowing what they were, you know. And then, but the wish to actually take the life of another, another living being has so never really been um, me. And so it was interesting to have this conversation of like, oh, well, you know, the country is going into this situation now, and. You know, and I realized, well, maybe a lot of people are thinking this way. I don't know, but maybe they are. And what we need to be doing is not thinking about, is it all right to kill, but thinking about how do we develop strength in our own heart and mind that, that on in a way that's intense. We had this, uh, the, I expect you've probably seen that, the um, extraordinary um, demonstration in Portland last night. You'll see it. The, um, you know, a, a woman's response to the militarized police to, to stand naked in front of these police with a, with a mask and a, and a beanie and to stand there. And in, in that vulnerability and in that uh, literal nakedness, and, and um, it was disarming. What she did was disarming. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't confrontational. It wasn't angry. It wasn't afraid. Confident, centered, clear, radical, and very disarming. So after a little while, the police didn't know what to do, and they got in their cars and drove away. It was pretty amazing. So that was, you know, probably not everyone would be able to pull that one off. <laughs> but that was a, an extraordinary response. It was harmless. And uh, we just heard about the, the death of John Lewis, an amazing, amazing man who 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 dedicated his life to on violence and to justice and um, you know he had been speaking out for you know, since decades continuously for the rights of african-american people and for uh, you know equal rights but, and he always 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 advocated harmlessness and people criticized him for it and people you know, ridiculed him for it, and he never ever changed that clear message that the change has to come through through harm. And he was beaten. You know, he went through. He was jailed, beaten many times. He was really clear, really clear in his heart that the way of harmlessness is is aligned with. It's a very deep. Morality, very so beautiful to you know. I read about his life some some years ago. It's very beautiful to see someone who's just so clear 
and so um, challenged and yet so clear and just remaining so clear throughout the whole of his life. So, uh, you know, we, uh, we are in challenging times. We are in extraordinary times right now. And I believe that the Buddhist teaching was given for any occasion, every occasion. And these precepts are a, a protection for yourself and for others. And, uh, and in relation to the, the Eightfold Path, they are also bringing you directly into alignment with the path. Freedom path awakening. And as you may notice, you know, as, as one person awakens, that the, around them others start to wake up too. It's difficult to stay really unconscious when you're with somebody who's really conscious. You, know, you start to, you can't help but start to sort of feel like, oh, you know, and maybe you notice that the, the areas where you're a little bit uh, careless or shabby in, inside. Or um, the, the things that you haven't bothered to cultivate that you actually recognize, like, gosh, if I did. And so, you know, I've had the good fortune to be around people who have this, this brightness and clarity. And uh, it encourages you to align in the mind. I would, I think it's three. So am I supposed to stop now? <laughs> oh. I want to hear a question or two. That was so beautiful. And then the body, yeah, I mean, we can stay on. There's no, nobody else using the room. <laughs> okay. okay, I would love to hear a little bit, a few, you know, any comments or questions. And then if you need to go, that's fine. It's supposed to end at three. So I, um, thank you. I have. Um, I, I just wanted to share that I had read something um, about John Lewis um, and his life. I, I was away for a few days, so I, I just found out last night. And um, just the power of how um, dynamic his action was and there was a piece about a um that he had been beaten badly and uh the the guy was a former kkk um person and um had come back um like years later sort of live with this terrible guilt i i guess of of what he had done and he had done a number of so sort of pretty horrific in my mind things and he he came back and he apologized and it apparently just really transformed his own life and uh and for john lewis as well and it i mean it it just speaks to what you were saying i mean his the actions of, of just um it, it rippled out and um and it made me feel so grateful that also this other man who had, you know, grown up with whatever he had grown up with and, you know, that he didn't fully understand, but it had such an impact on his, his life. And it, it, I, I imagine it really relieved some of that sadness that he felt about what he had done. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it takes a while, but it's worth it.
guess I could ask you the question, is, is um, right action something you reflect on in, in your life and in your practice? And, and how does it, how might it manifest? What are the challenges to it? Perhaps we should return the, turn the recording off, that might help. <laughs> sure. <laughs>